If you look at any history book, you will find one of West Orange's most prominent residents was Thomas Edison. He lived and worked here in West Orange and deserves his rightful place in history. However, there was so much more to the history of West Orange than Thomas Edison. I'm on Wheatland Avenue in West Orange at the foot of the mountain, and today we're going to discover the forgotten history of the once majestic Cable Road. In 1888, construction began at this exact location, grading a route up the mountain for West Orange's cable cars. It ran in a straight line from the base of the mountain below. It was less than a mile long and crossed Gregory Avenue at a point directly behind me as it climbed up the mountain. It emerged here at the summit of the mountain for about 10 years beginning in 1892. It came through a spectacular 30 foot deep rock cut behind me that is now overgrown with trees, weeds, and years of neglect. Practically no evidence exists of this once grand endeavor known as the Cable Road. It has become completely obscured by modern development and has slowly sank into the abyss of forgotten places. Hi, I'm Joe Fagan and join me on a search of the forgotten Cable Road as we discover West Orange. Our journey begins where I first discovered the Cable Road. I was only seven years old and living in West Orange. The Cable Road was long gone and only existed as a memory to those old enough to remember it. One Saturday morning in 1964, I came with my grandfather to this bank. Up on the wall in the bank were three huge paintings and one of them was of the Cable Road. The same paintings are still here today. But as a seven-year-old who loved trains, the picture of the cable cars caught my eye and interest. It looked like a boat on train tracks. I didn't know exactly what it was at the time, but that painting was enough to spark my curiosity. I asked my grandfather what kind of train that was, but I was too young to remember what he may have told me. Ironically, he probably could have told me a great deal. He was born in 1901 in nearby Orange, less than a mile from the bank. The cable road was actually still in operation and only about a mile and a half away in the other direction. Maybe as a young boy he sought a road on the trolley cars that followed with his father. His father was also born in Orange and lived there his whole life. So my grandfather most likely would have had a great deal of first-hand knowledge. He however passed away in 1965 and with him any chance of me ever hearing about West Orange's cable road directly from him. But because of him and our visit to the bank in 1964, I discovered the Cable Road. So four generations later from this location where it began for me, our search begins for the forgotten history of the Cable Road. Today hundreds of cars per hour transverse the steep incline up and down the mountain over Northfield Road here in West Orange. It is such an effortless task in today's modern automobile that I'm sure most motorists give it no thought whatsoever. In a matter of just a few minutes you can go up or down the mountain with maybe only the delay of a traffic light at Gregory Avenue. Northfield Road was originally an old dirt path and Indian trail that was used by the early settlers for passage over the mountain. However, coming up or down the mountain as we do today was not always an easy or safe undertaking. In fact, not only was it time consuming, it also could be dangerous negotiating the grade. A cable railroad up the side of the mountain would provide an alternate means of climbing the mountain, but the driving force behind the development of the cable railroad was really not about serving the public. It was more about selling real estate and land speculation. In 1888, a group of predominant orange businessmen headed by George A. Spotswood had an idea. They purchased the land on the eastern slope of the Orange Mountain overlooking the entire Orange Valley. The land had been purchased from a land company in receivership. The previous land company had anticipated the need for home sites due to the rise of industry in the Orange Valley. However, a financial panic of 1872 derailed the need that was anticipated. Spotswood and his associates realized that in order to sell the home sites, potential buyers needed a reliable and safe means of getting up and down the mountain other than Northfield Avenue. So they formed two separate companies. 
the Orange Mountain Land Company, and the Orange Mountain Cable Company. The land company would sell the home sites, and the cable company would provide the transportation. In one sense, they were right, but they held an extremely optimistic view of the future. They knew once all the land was sold, the Orange Mountain Land Company would cease to exist. However, they incorrectly thought that the Orange Mountain Cable Company would serve a perpetual need. Apparently, they felt they would be immune from any effects of the relatively new and developing technology of something called an automobile. Construction would begin in the winter of 1888. The eastern terminus of the cable road would begin at the foot of the mountain opposite Valley Road at what today is Wheatland Avenue in West Orange. It would run in a straight line up the mountain to the summit. At the time, the entire hillside was completely undeveloped and barren. All the grading had to be done by pick and shovel and carted off in horse and buggy. Clearing the land may have been difficult, but removing tons of rock from the hillside was even a harder task. A steam-driven stone drill was used to chip away at the mountain. The biggest challenge would be the deep rock cut near the summit. This rock cut would come to be the defining image of West Orange's Cable Road. The workforce would have had to been a rugged lot of individuals, having to brave both the elements and long hours of hard labor. The only street the Cable Road crossed on the way up the mountainside was Gregory Avenue. At the time, unlike today, traffic was a non-existent problem or concern. The house shown in this 1888 photograph is still standing today. Construction continued on for two years, including the long cold winters of 1888 and 1889. The mountain was by no means a wilderness, but in terms of working conditions it might as well have been. By the spring of 1890, it would still be two years before the first cable cars would be put into operation. But the cut through the rocky terrain was beginning to take shape. It was now easy to see and gauge for both residents of the Orange Valley and workers the noticeable progress that was being made on the mountainside. The cable road would simply be a straight shot up the side of the mountain from the starting point in the valley to the summit. It was a total distance of about a mile with a clear line of sight from the top to the bottom up and down the grade. A crew of men working as stone cutters worked off of planks and would chip away at the rock. The pieces would fall at their feet and into a pile below. The rocks would then be loaded into waiting horse-drawn wagons and carted away back down the mountain. Other men would work at maintaining grade with pick and shovel as work progressed. Finally, by the summer of 1892, the cable road opened for operation. The line consisted of two tracks extending from Valley Road to the top of the mountain, terminating at what today would be the tennis courts of Rock Spring Country Club. Two cars, one on each track, were attached to opposite ends of a continuous cable. The cable was wrapped around a large drum in the powerhouse at the top of the deep rock cut. The drum was powered by steam. When one car was raised, the other car was automatically lowered, acting as a counterweight. The two cars only passed one another, going in opposite directions at the halfway point. Each car had a conductor, but an engineer sitting in the powerhouse controlled the operation. He had a clear line of sight up and down the grade, which was necessary and crucial for the safe operation of the cable cars. Stations were built at Valley Road, Gregory Avenue, and at the powerhouse at the top. The cars were large platforms, each with a covered open-air passenger cabin off to one side. The front gangway was much like that of a ferry boat. The cars were intended to take both passengers and horse-drawn teams up or down the mountain. Each car had two trucks with a compensating device, which kept the deck level all the way up the grade. The cable road received prompt patronage when it went into operation in 1892 from both residents and from Teamsters looking to avoid a long, tiresome, and somewhat dangerous climb up Northfield Avenue. Most likely today in 2006, there was no one who was alive when the cable road was in operation. So knowing anything about its day-to-day -day operations from someone who saw it or wrote it would be difficult. However, some facts can be determined from surviving company records, which give us a glimpse at what daily operations may have been like. The day cards of the Orange Mountain Cable Company were official company records on daily operations. 
They were carried in the conductor's pocket all day long and were a means for recording various information about that day's activities. In 1895, we know that Charles A. Hanley was the conductor of car number one and Christine was the conductor of car number two. Also at that time, it seems that the cable cars ran on a schedule. Since they were both connected to the same cable, they were on the same schedule, but going in different directions. They ran up and down the mountain every 15 minutes starting at 7 o'clock in the morning with the last trip at 7.30 in the evening. An average day would collect between $5 and $6 in revenue. The fare charge was $0.05 cents for a passenger on foot, $0.10 cents for a passenger with a bicycle, $0.15 cents for a horse-drawn wagon, and $0.25 cents if it was a two-horse-drawn wagon. The records also indicate that the Spotswood Coal Company was using the cable road to make coal deliveries up the mountain, presumably to homes in St. Cloud. Since George Spotswood was one of the owners of the cable road, wagons from his lumber business passed without charge. Records indicate that on an average day, such as April 4, 1895, car number 1 and 2 carried combined a total of 72 passengers, 2 bicycles, 7 wagons with 1 horse, and 4 wagons with 2 horses, for a total collected revenue of $5.85. As 1895 drew to a close, the Orange Mountain Cable Company and Land Company were in financial trouble. The cable cars had been attracting mostly sightseers and hikers, but not many land buyers. The lack of any rail connection at the foot of the cable road, as once expected, never materialized. This left the cable road as very little use for commuters and did nothing to encourage the sale of land. Both companies were forced into receivership, and by 1896 operations ceased. It took four long years of backbreaking work to build but in the same span of time all the hope of a financially stable future were all but gone. The Orange Mountain Cable Company would no longer exist. The cable road, however, was not completely doomed. Operations would resume within two years, reorganized under a new company name with a new plan for a promising future. In 1898, in Havana Harbor in Cuba, an explosion aboard the anchored battleship USS Maine ignites tensions between the United States and Spain. Within months, the two nations would be thrust into what came to be known as the Spanish-American War. In 1898, in Washington, D.C., the 25th President of the United States, William McKinley, was in the first year of his first term. Within three years, he sadly would fall victim to an assassin's bullet. And in 1898, in the relatively obscure place of West Orange, New Jersey, the newly formed Orange Mountain Traction Company resumed operations on the cable road. Renewed hope at recapturing its former glamour, reborn under new ownership with a vision for success.